The grandson of the founder of the nation's largest garlic company, Christopher Ranch, and the Gilroy Garlic Festival, Ken Christopher continues the traditions and legacy of his family. As executive vice president of the ranch and president of the Christopher Foundation, Ken works to build public-private partnerships in support of childhood education, the performing arts, and fighting food scarcity. The past few years have presented unique and unthinkable challenges for both his business and community, and these experiences have shaped him to become the leader he is today. Welcome to the stage, Ken Christopher. So, O-O-D-A, OODA, funny sounding acronym, but this strange sound has been my North Star throughout my entire career. It's an expression that I learned in grad school that's not only a core component of training for the U.S. Air Force, but is also applicable to many other high stress scenarios, observation, orientation, decision, action. The fighter pilot, or executive, that can best perform the four stages of UDA quickly and correctly is the one that emerges the winner in just about any scenario. Observation. Understand the space you're in. What are your goals and objectives? Orientation. What are the obstacles that potentially stand in your path, and how can you relate to that challenge? Decision. Strategize a game plan, one that gets you ahead of your obstacle and to your goal. And, of course, action. Execute the decision in a precise and firm manner. The theory is the fighter pilot, the athlete, or the executive that completes the stages of UDA first will likely come out the victor. Today, I'll be presenting three real-life case studies where this tactic has served me well. Okay, with that little sidebar out of the way, good morning. <laughs> I'm the Executive Vice President of Christopher Ranch, Ken Christopher, and I'm so excited to be here with you all today. And today, I wanna to talk a little bit about leadership, perseverance, and how to build a path forward when faced with seemingly impossible odds. A little about myself. After completing business school and getting my MBA, I joined my family's company in 2010. I started off as a production manager, overseeing a crew of over 100 employees that shipped over 50 million pounds of fresh garlic nationwide. In my time, my portfolio grew to encompass management of sales, strategy, and marketing. I learned a lot about what it takes to run a 21st century farm, usually in real time, as globalization and technology have radically transformed what it means to be a modern farmer. When I joined the ranch, the greatest threat to my family and our 1,000 employees wasn't global warming, drought, or loss of farmland to Silicon Valley. It was a geopolitical threat, one centered halfway across the world that threatened to drive out American garlic farmers for good. There used to be 12 commercial garlic farms here in the US. But because of the flood of cheap and illegal Chinese garlic, we as a nation are down to only three garlic farms, with Christopher Ranch being the largest. It was my grandfather in 1994 that first petitioned the US government to put a stop to the unfair economic environment that was going on. In the end, his work was successful. And to this day, taxes are imposed on Chinese garlic shippers that routinely break US law. But as we all know, good things come to an end. And within a few years, foreign exporters begin to find ways to cheat the rules and resume the illegal dumping of garlic. When I joined the company, it was obvious that more needed to be done to protect American farmers and American jobs, but our options were limited. Despite this challenge, we managed to carve out a lane that seemed to work. Then, in January 2018, all hell broke loose. <laughs> Netflix aired a docu-series that directly attacked my family's farm. I'm gonna ask you all to take a second and just try to imagine 
what it would be like to see your family's life's work drug through the mud in front of millions, all for the sake of clickbait and entertainment. With my grandfather entering retirement after decades of service, and my dad focused on our day-to-day -day operations, it was decided that I would become the point person to handle the incoming crisis. You can imagine being accused of propping up the Chinese international slave industry, which sent anyone into a mild panic. Within days, major customers like Whole Foods, Walmart, and Costco were calling us, demanding explanations, confused by the shoppers at their stores demanding to know what's going on with Christopher Ranch Garlic. Major accounts that took years to build relationships with were now on the line. At the same time, media outlets were flooding my phone line, each requesting on-camera interviews. Let me first say that I'm not naturally a gifted public speaker, and that I had no training in public relations when I had to step in and try to contain the firestorm that was getting out of control. I was out for blood, furious that a major media company would air a completely untrue hatchet job documentary. But losing my cool and surrendering to my natural instincts wouldn't get me to my objective. In the court of public opinion, cool, calm, and collected wins every time. I had to steel myself and quickly learn how to turn incredibly complex topics like global trade systems into clean sound bites. On TV, print, radio, and podcasts, you only have a tiny window to get your message out. I was now representing my family, my company, our employees, and my grandfather's legacy, and I could not fail. In the end, it helped that the docuseries was both completely bogus and poorly vetted, and that we were on the right side of history. Anxiety and nerves be damned, I took every meeting and did every media request. I chose not to engage professional PR crisis managers, and that gave our approach an unmatched authenticity with myself directly communicating to the public. In each interview, I got more confident and more effective in offering the truth of the situation. In short, Netflix was wrong and produced a piece of infotainment that could have seriously injured the American garlic industry. It's frustrating that four years later, the show can still be streamed online. But now, the show looks more ridiculous and unfounded as ever. It turns out, when you represent an ethical company, history shines a little bit brighter on you. In the following months, I realized that sunlight is the best disinfectant when it comes to course correcting a narrative. For generations, our processes have been closely guarded, protected as trade secrets, only to be shared within our company. In 2018, I changed all that. I built a team that's mission was to capture the heart of what makes Christopher Ranch so great. To date, we publish content that takes garlic lovers and haters across everything it takes to be the nation's largest garlic company. From seed selection, to planting, to harvest, to cold storage, employee profiles, and our products, nothing is off limits. And now we have the highest rates of social engagement that are the envy of the entire produce industry. I learned how to use the news of the day, be it a trade war, election, or a drought crisis, to insert Christopher Ranch's opinion or perspective. In this way, I can use earned media to continue to differentiate our products from the rest. I was able to shift the narrative away from the garbage swarming around a documentary and position ourselves as the preeminent all-American garlic company. It was through the spring and summer of 2018 that news was breaking for the first time that the Trump administration was considering implementing a batch of tariffs, or taxes, on imports from China. This presented a rare opportunity to further protect the American garlic industry from our biggest competition. And so, once again, I dug deep, pushed past my fears, and went to Washington, D.C. to lobby the executive and legislative branches. I met with politicos from both parties, building a consensus 
that garlic should be included in any government action against China. The disciplined and rapid fire approach to concisely make my case was born of the previous Netflix incident and served me well in my fight to protect American farmers. Fear gripped me every step of the way. One misstep and I could miss the best chance to protect all American garlic farmers. I had to turn on the charm, affect confidence, and smoothly and clearly lay out my case to Democrats and Republicans alike. Personal political ideology could have no place as I had one mission, protect American farmers from overseas threats. Whether I was in the majority leader's office or huddles with staffers from opposition party, my message had to be a unifying one. Each meeting ended well, with leaders from across the aisle signing on to support our cause. But what they didn't see is that after every meeting, after pleasantries were exchanged, I'd walk out and have to take a deep breath and calm my nerves before the next appointment. I remember my lawyers calling me a political animal, them never realizing that I was simply playing the part with everything I had, unaware of the fear that had now finally subsided. This diplomatic mission of mine was capped off with testimony to the US, US International Trade Court. This was it. This was the big leagues. Under oath, I had five minutes to make my case, which was then questioned in real time by representatives of the US Department of State, Homeland Security, Commerce, and more. Above the stand, I try to portray a cool and calm demeanor as I systematically walk the panel through all the injuries sustained by American garlic farmers by corrupt Chinese exporters. Beneath the stand, my right leg started shaking like crazy. The gentleman testifying after me later pulled me aside and actually asked if I was a professional speaker. It took everything I had not to laugh out loud but I couldn't, be, I couldn't help but feel proud about the fact that no one saw my fear. It was one month later that news broke that the government had in fact made sure to include garlic on the list of protected goods. To this date, my efforts in DC remain one of my proudest accomplishments. And to this date, the flag that was flying over the US Capitol when garlic tariffs went into effect is now in my home office the ultimate symbol of overcoming fear. My grandfather taught me a lot about leadership and his work both in business and in our community continue to inspire me. When I joined the family business, I had no idea that I was being groomed to take on a more public persona. In early 2019, he decided to slow down his schedule, handing off more community-based responsibilities to me. For all the incredible things he's done with his life, the one closest to his heart, and you can guess it, is the Gyorai Garlic Festival. With millions of tickets sold over the years, the global reputation that put Gyorai on the map, the festival means so much, more than any of us can articulate. In the years leading up to 2019, I was my grandfather's point man for making sure the festival had all the resources, all the support, that it needed to grow year after year. I grew close with a governing board and began to insert myself with the culture of the Garlic Festival. It sounds selfish looking back, but it began to form a part of my identity. And deep down, I finally felt connected to it in the way that my grandfather first did back in 1979. I made it my mission to do all I could to boost marketing behind the festival and try to break all previous attendance records. We hired Grammy award-winning musicians, celebrity chefs, media personalities, and my team from Christopher Ranch was with me every step of the way as we encouraged the community to come out and support our hometown's pride and joy. I took every interview so much more at ease than I had ever been with the press just a couple of years before. Thinking back to that time, I realized how different I was as a leader, contrasted to just a couple years pre previously. 
I was not only getting good at being a public figure, I started to love it. That Sunday afternoon, I had wrapped up all my commitments at the festival and was home with friends and family, like many of you, so proud of all the work we'd done. I was so proud of the work I'd done, confident that the baton from grandfather to grandson had been passed. Then my phone rang, I answered, and everything changed. It's surreal to think about what one moment can do. Seconds before the call, I was pumping up my own ego, so sure that this new and confident leader that I'd become. Seconds after the call, it all came crashing down. Whether I was right or wrong to feel it, the truth is that this has become something so important to me, and it was violated, and people died. In this instance, guilt and grief consumed me. With association and city officials confronted by potential liability from lawsuits, there was a temporary void of leadership, a lack of a voice for the community. People in our hometown were scared, confused, and devastated. As the executive of a private company, I wasn't beholden to lawyers and crisis managers. And so, my team and I engaged with the community. Our initial message of pain and recovery reached millions. My team and I focused on raising money for the victims, primarily through the Gilroy Foundation. This was the genesis of the Christopher Foundation and our Gilroy Strong initiative. In the aftermath of July 2019, my team got together and decided to engage with our hometown in bigger ways than ever before. In channeling grief into acts of good work, we all found a way to heal. Through our partners at St. Joseph's, Rebecca Children's Services, your Unified School District, and others, we have and continue to make challenge change for the betterment of our community. Going forward, not only would we champion California-grown garlic, but augment our core mission to include raising funds in support of the incredible local nonprofits that can make lasting change. In the years since these three events, Netflix, my time in DC, and the 2019 attack, myself and all of you assembled here have had to confront a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic. I won't go into too much detail, but for two years, we had to change our approach to going to business in order to survive in a rapidly changing environment. As hard or upsetting or nerve-wracking, the lessons I've learned are they have given me the ability to think clearly, remain calm, and execute the best possible decisions. These lessons have made me the leader that I am today. In each of these experiences, I had to learn to deal with forces I could have never have expected. In the Netflix scenario, I was confronted with waves of anxiety, knowing that everything was on the line, on a global stage, to right the wrongs by a perpetuated fake David versus Goliath story. In encountering the fear of failing an entire industry in petitioning the federal government to right a multi-generational wrong, I learned about the reservoir of strength that surely rests within all of us. And hardest of all, the darkest corners of grief can envelop your soul and drag you down. But in learning to look to the light and reassess your role and your mission on this earth, you can find a path forward. I have to be real with you. None of these events were easy. It took everything I had to push through and get to the other side of each crisis. But in doing so, each and every experience prepared me to face the next hurdle and will prepare me to face challenges that will surely arise in the future. It's when you confront barriers head on. It's my experience that you can learn and grow to be a leader. To say I've had a wild past four years would be an understatement. But it's my hope that these lessons from my life can inspire you to fight the hard fight, believe in yourself, and always look to a bright future. Remember, observe, orient, decide, and act. Thank you.